started, I just want to say that um, this proposal and this application would not have been possible without the support of the Bridge Street community, school, and the Board 3 community, and others, as well as Michaela O'Brien and Mandy Gary, who have really um, helped head this project. So I just wanted to publicly thank them and Michael uh, for the design and for all of our supporters here tonight. So we do have a, a, present, a short presentation for you. Um, up there. Should I just say on the next slide? Okay. Okay. So, um, we are here tonight um, for a proposal to rehabilitate the Bridge Street School playground. And we can go ahead and put it. You can even skip that one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the biggest concern at Bridge Street is the safety and um, the health risks that our current playground poses um, on our school staff, our students, and the community. Uh, we have a very dusty, unhealthy playground in the fall, summer, in the summer. And in the winter, it is uh, very icy, and in the spring, it is very muddy. There are many times where we have to cancel recess because it's unsafe for the students to be outside. Yesterday was a perfect example. It was too icy and too muddy, and we only could allow kids to play on the sidewalk. Um, and we also have um, health risks with the dust. We are not able to open our windows on that side of the building because of the amount of dust that comes into the building. Uh, that our children and uh, faculty and staff would be breathing in, as well as when they are out there running around and stirring it with us. Um, and with that comes the, the mess that also comes into the school and um, our custodial staff with the, the cleaning up of, of that. Uh, next slide, please. Can I interrupt you just to say this is younger? Visitors have just come in, and if they want to come and sit on the floor and you come sit with me, guys. You know what? Come sit next to me, then Mr. Chiquette won't be so nervous. <laughs> 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 All right. So the next couple of slides are just some pictures of the current playground. Those two pictures that are up there are the dirt that you usually see in the fall and the summer. And then on the next slide, you see um, what it looks like in the winter. Winter is snow and ice. Um, unfortunately, due to, you can go to the next slide, um, please, the budget constraints, the school budget con uh, constraints, we are not able to fund this through um, the school budget. And um, so that is why we have applied for the CPA application. We um, understand that we will be raising $35,000 in additional funds. Um, to help fund this project. Next slide, please. Uh, Bridge Street School currently serves around 300 uh, students, pre-K through five. We have 37.8% free and reduced lunch, 33.5% of our students are minority, and 31.3 students with disabilities. We're in a Ward 3 neighborhood, and um, we don't just see ourselves as a school community with a school playground. We see our school as um, an integral part of the downtown community and having access to a healthy and safe playground for the community is really um, important to us. Uh, the next slide is just um, a quote from one of the teachers at, at Bridge Street. So our proposal, and I don't know, maybe if you want to just kind of oh, yeah, sure. show the, um, the design there. It's kind of broken up into three play zones um, with a concrete path that will go around the perimeter, which will accommodate our school's walking club and for students who may just want to walk during recess and for community members to walk or ride their bikes. Um, Berkshire Design Group has prepared this final um, plan for us, and you um, can see the middle section that I believe is green on that, is uh, poured in place um, material that is ADA compliant, and um, I'm sure if you have questions more about the material and the design, um, Michael will be happy to answer those. The next slide is just an aerial view of the Bridge Street School Playground. And the slide after that is the design that Mandy is walking around with. 
and you'll see the pathway on there, the, the area for the poured rubber um, material. Tree, we have um, some trees and picnic tables and benches, um, a spot for basketball and wall ball for the students, and then some natural elements, um, some logs that are loaded to the ground for the kids to climb on, and different stuff, stumps and a rock. And the next slide again is just another quote from our kindergarten staff. <laughs> so the benefits of our project, we will be creating a 10,900 square foot new ADA compliant playground um, for our students and community. That will also incorporate garden space for our students to use um, as an outdoor learning area, as well as for the community to enjoy as well. We are also um, looking at putting in a special space on our playground called Marie's Corner. Um, we had a very special colleague of ours who taught at Bridge Street School who passed away in the fall, and we are looking at um, creating an area of the playground in, in her memory. There we go, thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, I think as I stated earlier, besides benefiting um, the, the students and the faculty and staff at Bridge Street, this project will really benefit the community, um, the Ward 3 community and the greater downtown community, Northampton. Um, we have many people who like to come in and use the Bridge Street Playground, um, which is great. Um, but I have to say right now, it's not a very welcoming playground with the condition that it's in, and we want it to be welcoming. We want people to um, feel like they have a place where, that is safe and healthy for them to play with their children. And um, I think one more, please. And then there's another quote up there from a um, community member and Bridge Street parent. Parents. Um, the thing that is so wonderful about this project is really the amount of support we've um, received from the community. We had over 250 signatures um, on a petition that we did earlier in the year. Um, and it's just really wonderful, um, as you can see tonight, to have students and parents and community members here to really support this project. Um, it really shows how important this is to us and how important the the health and the safety of our students and surrounding community uh, really is to us. And um, on the next slide, you'll see a list of um, <coughs> support from. And then the next slide is just the proposed um, project dates. So we are anticipating um, if this all goes through with construction being done before the first day of school. And the last slide is just one last quote um, from a Ward 4 counselor, Ember Street Parents. And I thank you for your time, and I will open it up for questions for Mandy and Michaela and myself and Michael. So thank you. Yes. Questions? We had a couple of questions. First, I want to say it's great to see this room filled. It's only because it keeps us all warm. <laughs> because it's just nice to see people embrace the concept of CPA and know that people would like to use money for something that's going to help them in their daily lives. Uh, two, I am largely supportive of the project. I do have a couple of questions that kind of stem from the application. Uh, the first one has to do with the piling of the snow on the basketball court. Uh, and that seems to be the current practice, or at least the past yeah. practice. Has there been any discussion with the city on a different manner of snow removal so that that snow isn't sitting on top of something that we really created? We did meet with the mayor and Dave Pomerantz um, early on in this process. And we were told by Dave Pomerantz that there would be no other way to deal with the snow. So that's in part why the section of the new design is a surface, is an asphalt surface that would be able to 
external accommodation to the salt and sand and snow that ends up there, we, we would love to see another, another solution to that. The way that the snow is um, I, um, my name's Mandy Doyer, for example. Um, I have been out doing the recess duty, which is not my usual job the last couple of days, which has been really fun. Um, fun to do with the kids, but fun just to kind of see how the space is really how it's used and um, the snow mound is a is a really it takes up about half of our playground currently um, and I think we are really going to have to figure out how we can uh, maybe you know it's a fun place for kids to play the kids really enjoy the snow mound it's you know slides and king of the mountain and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. but we really are going to have to think about um, I think parking away about half the snow but just because it does take up so much of our playground space, and it's really not a large playground to start with, and um, when we have this huge amount of snow melting and sitting on the surface, it really prevents kids from being able to use the playground. Um, you know, it's fun for a while, and then it kind of just becomes ice. muddy and ice and dirty, and we've got to keep the kids, off, you know, away from it and off of it. Um, so I think that will have to be a discussion that we have with the city about, you know, at a certain point, we need to truck the snow away and, and do something. Like that. Uh, in your application, it stated that the, what was in the schematic wasn't necessarily fully represented by this budget. Can you identify? Which of those features would not you cover this round? Um, there are mostly the uh, additional structures that were on a, what we are calling now the wish list, um, but we do have an update on that, sorry. Um, there are a couple of structures that were drawn in to the design that when we got the price tag for them, we realized that we couldn't come to CPA ask for that kind of money. So since, um, since we submitted the application, we have been working with um, Valley Home Improvement on, on um, donating their services because they're looking for a community project. So we are very clear. We have a design and, and a, sort of a budget of value of how much uh, one or two of these would cost for them to, to provide for us. Um. I think it's so great to see all you kids out here. This is fabulous. You should be congratulating, congratulating yourself for coming out on the school night. Um, and it's good to be active young, and it's good to be active old. So uh, the question I have is, it seems a very ambitious timeline to wait for us until you know April and then go out to bid and have it all done before the school year begins again. And it, will you have to raise the 35000 before you go out to bid the private fundraising? And do you have a plan for that? And how realistic is it to raise $35,000, which is a, a lot of money? Um, I'm really trying to say that we've already raised about $12,000 of that without uh, really actually trying. This is our one page sheet that we will eventually be sending out people that we will the page. Um, donating to us, and um, so that didn't raise about twelve thousand dollars already. Um, it is ambitious, but we don't really have a choice. <laughs> That's what we're doing. <laughs> the plan um, and the work. Do you want to speak to the timeline of the work, Michael? Um, well, we've already um, endeavored ourselves into preparing a set of drawings that can be handed out to contractors for pricing. So we're not just stuck with this pretty picture. We actually have um, what we consider big red documents to go out. So as soon as we get the word, you know, we're going to uh, solicit, I believe we're solicit, uh, solicit three private bids, or public bids for this, at least. And then um, uh, the, the hard part about this is going to be um, probably making sure that any elements uh, that are uh, specialty items, such as the like benches or stuff, those, those have a kind of a long lead time, and that was also a problem with some of the uh, custom structures that we envisioned could be part of this, but we took out um, of the budget. But all the, all the rest of it is basically um, the rubber surfacing, the wood mulch extension of the existing playground, concrete walks in between this paving. 
that's not difficult to install over the course of one summer, certainly not. So we feel that this might can be done. Um, Um, actually, I made the briefing that was at the school, and there were this many people there uh, mm -hmm. from the community. So um, I, I'm encouraged about the project. Uh, my comments are not really so much for the school as they are for the uh, uh, a desire to coordinate plans between the school playground and Lampard Park. So my comments are more to the city and the parks department to uh, work with this. You're sort of leading in this case. You've already you've already come up with a design, and I think there's a, an interest uh, to, to coordinate what goes next door, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, the other concern I have is um, the neighborhood uses the school and will be using that part too, and I don't think there's even a crosswalk across Bridge Street. Yeah, there's right. there. there. yeah. there. yeah. okay. a crossing guard there. Okay. That's, that was my other question, to see if, if you had that. Um, and so it's a crossing guard during school hours, and it is, and is the uh, crosswalk marking, are they being put out? No, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a big sign that nobody put out for the school is coming in the morning. Are there other annual maintenance costs for this surface that are different from the, uh, the, the mud graph? If there are, how will that be covered? There's really not much maintenance involved in the surfacing. It's, if you would think of, the surfacing is very similar to a rubberized track surface. Mm -hmm. So if it, 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 if there is a possibility that it will get dirty, that it might get worn, but I highly doubt it in this case <coughs> with, you know, kids running around on it. Um, it, the surfacing stands up incredibly well. Uh, I just went and looked at a project down in Agawam that was done seven years ago, and there are no worn spots. There are no splits. The edges are still solid. They haven't come up. They haven't peeled up, which is remarkable considering that it just stops and there's just grass. Yeah. In our design, the rubber surfacing is completely surrounded by concrete walks, so that provides a protective edge. But really, the, the surfacing is incredibly durable. And I think all you would really probably want to do is, is sweep it up so the top of it with sand or dirt accumulates on it. And just as a follow up, is there substrate work that will allow greater uh, permeability of the ground so that, yes. because it's, it's marvelous to letting water run off right. and, and, and licking the water out. So that, so, so for a small rain, it looks like it's just a uh, no brainer. Yeah. But, but for soaking or for you know, this time of year? We, um, um, it, the design is actually pitched to two kind of low spots. So that'll help or um, encourage water to get off of the surface of the drainage system. Um, we've been in touch with uh, Dave Pomerantz, who uh, submitted some comments with concerns about maintenance and upkeep and that type of thing, and how exactly how we were going to deal with stormwater. And we found to do, um, some review with him and provided some responses to his concerns. And um, we think that you know this is probably the best solution for the small space that they just. And where does stormwater go from there? Uh, it actually, the, the city had recently, uh, a few years ago, extended the drain line. Uh, before there were just infiltration basins <laughs> underneath here without mm -hmm. an outlet pipe. The last um, infiltration test basin is here ne next to the existing paving, and they actually provided a drain pipe that goes around the building, in fact, out to, is it which street is that? Graves Avenue. Yeah. Avenue. Yeah. So they've actually, um, I, I would say, improved the system so that there is an outlet. When you can get gravity flow from that. That's right. Correct. Thank you. So the next item is public comment on specific proposals. Um, uh, Jim, okay. uh, could you uh, explain to some of our younger attorneys how the 
everyone to tell them who we are. And, yeah. Well, well, perhaps just to also uh, if they wanted to, they're, they and their parents, they could escort their parents home. Now. So we take your parents' money. We <laughs> <laughs> give it back to you. <laughs> Preservation Committee, we, um, we make recommendations to the City Council. We do not award money, we just make recommendations. The City Council decides whether and how to spend 3% surcharge on property taxes. Um, we have representation on both uh, elected, um, and we have elected representatives, we have someone from the Housing Authority, we have someone from the Recreation Committee, we have someone appointed by the Mayor, we have, I'm sorry, appointed by the City Council. Um, myself, uh, I'm from the Conservation Commission, uh, Doug Bruce is from the Planning Commission, and so the, the design of the statute was to bring together uh, people with knowledge from all different parts of the city government, um, as well as people that you vote for for three-year terms, um, four-year terms, four-year terms, like mm. the president, um, and as well as people who are appointed by the city council and appointed by uh, the mayor. So um, this is now our public comment portion the key to specific proposals. Um, I'm going to ask by a show of hands, how many people are here to speak to a proposal other than the Bridge Street School proposal? Okay, so, um, so what I'd like to do then um, is allow, since that's just a handful of people, um, it, it looks like, could we have the Housing Support Services uh, application present now? Um, public comment on that proposal if you step forward. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm the Director of the Housing Consumer Education Center at Housing. We provide services to families in Hampshire and Hammond County. And I'm here in full support of the funding for the application to uh, create a position, the Community Housing Support Manager, which will provide assistance to families in low income and subsidized housing in order to help them retain their tenancy and uh, keep them out of the housing court. I think it would be beneficial for the community to uh, have that person provide educational uh, component in terms of budgeting. Many of the families that become homeless uh, have enough income to, to pay for their housing, but they run into trouble when they perhaps get a paycheck once a month and aren't able to sort of allocate that over what needs to be taken care of on a monthly basis in terms of their rent. So um, I think it, it would also be nice to have uh, somebody work proactively for them to uh, per perhaps see a bunch of resources in the community, such as the Tenancy Preservation Program, uh, community legal advocates that could also educate them about what it means when you get a 14-day notice and what you really need to do to preserve your tenancy and to keep out of housing court and avoid eviction. So I think it would be a great investment in the community. It would stabilize housing. I think we would see a measurable outcome immediately in terms of people staying out of housing court, people maintaining their units. It's difficult enough for people to find low income and subsidized housing and if they can um, have some stability and some support in maintaining those units, I think it's beneficial both to the community and to the families. So I would uh, urge you to support that funding and I would look forward to working collaboratively with that person in that position. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good evening, folks. My name is Tom O'Connor. I'm actually the attorney for the Northampton Housing Authority. I've uh, served in that role for 15 years or so now. The last 10 or so, I've been their general counsel. One of the main things I do for them is handle their evictions. And there are hundreds and hundreds of them over the last 10, 15 years that I've, I've handled for them. The vast majority of them, I'd say 95% of them are non paid evictions. Uh, and thankfully, the vast majority of them do not end in an eviction. Unfortunately, they do end up going back to court 
month after month after month for months for a loosely supervised uh, court agreement, and, and most of the tenants have to pay off what they owe, and their tenancy is reinstated. But I'd like to tell people we're the housing authority, we're not the unhousing authority. Our goal is not to evict people. Um, and a program like this, I think, is going to do wonders. I'm here to, on behalf of the housing authority to offer our wholehearted support for it. I think what they're going to do is step in at a time that is most needed, at a time when the tenant is first starting to lose control of their ability to pay the rent. Not after they've already been to court and they're with me. Um, they're going to step in, offer, offer their services, offer their uh, their guidance with respect to prioritizing the tenant's uh, monthly bills. You see that many, many times where the tenant has a fixed income, and what ends up happening is they start to pay uh, bill B uh, instead of bill A, which is their rent. Uh, and then they pay bill, pay bill C, D, and E, and all of a sudden there's no money left for their rent, and um, they're stuck on the, the Ferris wheel and the things that they put the courthouse in portion. So this program is going to offer some supervision, some guidance. It's going to offer the steering, uh, I think, some tenants to some of the, the many programs that are out there. And tenants, frankly, don't know we're out there, A or B, when they do land there, they don't have the wherewithal to properly go through the application process to access the funds that may be there um, to uh, to pay off off their uh, the amount of rearage that's owed. So I think the program is going to be wonderful um, from a purely self-interested point of view. Um, it may take a lot of my business away, uh, but frankly, there's a lot of other things for me to do over at the Housing Authority. And um, I would welcome the opportunity to spend more time doing some of the other things rather than, um, um, you know, bringing people to court. Uh, frankly, a lot of times it needs to. So I think this program will do a lot to eliminate that. And again, I urge you to support the funding for the program. Thank you. If I could ask you a quick question. We heard a very impressive presentation from the applicant last time. Very, uh, um, very thoughtful. And um, one of the questions I asked was about a, a metric of looking at the success of, of this uh, project. And it was suggested that seeing a decline in the uh, eviction rate here in Northampton over an annual basis might be one metric. Is that, is that a reasonable thought for you? Um, absolutely. And it, 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 it depends entirely how you define eviction. Um, eviction as in someone that's actually you know, physically removed from the apartment or eviction as someone who never comes to me for the purpose of filing a complaint with either the district court or the housing court. That's a needless expense for a tenant. It's $135 at the housing court, $195 at district court. And many of those filings that come to me, which are eviction cases, uh, get worked out. I'd say 95 plus percent of them get worked out. I think a fair measure of the success would be how many never actually come to me for that purpose, as well as an actual drop in the number of folks that are. And that's a collected, that's a collected data. I mean, you, you would be able to let oh, us know yeah, about absolutely. that and hear from that. Right. Yes, we keep, uh, you know, right down to the number of the number of, it's called a notice to quit. That is the, the document that gets served on the tenant by, doesn't have to be served by the sheriff, but uh, sometimes it is, we usually do not serve the way. And that says the tenant has 14 days to leave or we're going to court to collect this rent. And that's what we always do when we go to court to collect the rent. And the process has been done. But I think a, a very good measure would be of those 14 day notices to quit. How many of them are steered to this program and never actually come to me? That would be the best measure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Among other things, CLA aims to prevent homelessness by helping indigent individuals and families gain access to affordable housing programs and defend themselves against eviction. On CLA's behalf, I would like to voice my support for the Community Housing Supportive Services Project. As part of the Housing Court Intervention Project, I provide limited assistance representation to low-income tenants facing eviction in Northampton and Greenfield. I advise tenants negotiate agreements and advocate for them before the judge. Often, in eviction cases, tenants need extra help following through with the terms of their agreements. 
especially with payment plans and rep payee. Legal aid attorneys oftentimes do not have the resources to assist clients with the case management aspect of the, of the case once the legal issue has been resolved. If a tenant is working with a social worker, they are often fo focused on the mental health problems of the tenant and don't have the knowledge of housing issues necessary to assist the tenant with maintaining his or her tenancy. A community housing support manager that is focused on housing issues would be a tremendous asset to tenants in Northampton. There is currently a gap in services for tenants regarding financial literacy and budget counseling. Tenants currently benefit greatly from the Tenancy Preservation Project that is in the Western Housing Court, and it is helpful for legal aid attorneys to collaborate with mental health professionals from TPP to address the mental health aspects of why a tenant may be facing eviction. If there was a community housing support manager focused on addressing the financial issues surrounding eviction, tenants would have a greater chance at solving the problems that brought them into housing court on a deeper level. This would bring about lasting change in a tenant's life and perhaps avoid future non-payment eviction cases. I had a case where I represented a tenant in an eviction action who also had a Section 8 voucher. After months of court hearings, motions, and a Section 8 hearing, I was able to maintain the tenancy in the eviction case and prevent the termination of the tenant's Section 8 benefits. Part of the negotiation in both the Section 8 case and the eviction case was that the tenant's mother be named the official representative payee. Once the case was over, as the housing attorney, I not only gave the tenant information to set up the rep payee, but also felt compelled to keep checking in to see that it was actually set up because the tenant and her mother found the process challenging. If there was a community housing support manager working with the tenant in a situation like this to set up a rep payee, it would help to ensure that the legal victories in housing court are sustained once tenants leave the courtroom. Thank you very much. Hi, how are you? I'm Wanda Malone. I'm director of Shelter and Housing Programs for Service Set. I actually work with homeless individuals after the fact, and those before. I'm here to support the Northampton Housing, housing Partnership in applying for the Community Preservation Act funds uh, in hopes that uh, it will help our community members maintain their housing. I was fortunate enough to be able to apply for the Community Preservation Funds last year for first, last, and security funds to help them move in because that was an issue that was um, very hard for folks just to come up with that kind of money. And it's important that once they're in their housing, now what do we do to help them keep, uh, maintain their housing? And this is a great time to really have somebody to help them to work on those budgets, work on whatever it is that they need to be able to maintain that before they get the eviction. Because what happens is, mm -hmm. in working with the homeless folks, they get housed, life happens, lose jobs, family gets ill, they get ill, something always happens, something comes up, and there's nowhere to find any support for this. So at least it gets them to keep their place and not have to end up back in the homeless shelters. Um, we can continue that process with them. So this is a great thing. It doesn't look like on this round that we'll be uh, in a competitive nature between projects, but we often are. And um, so you're, this is the perfect opportunity to ask you the hypothetical question of if it were last round and we were talking to you about the first last uh, arrangement, or it's this round and we're talking about counseling services, which one seems most valuable to you? I, they both are valuable in their own way. Um, it's really hard for me to say, but of course, maintaining housing. I mean, the, the fact is we have to get them housed first and then work on keeping them in there. And so they're both just as equal to me. The dog that's for you know, they, they actually, they actually they, come they, in at different costs to us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Father, can you pass the call up? Oh, I'm sorry. Perhaps any others in the room who are specialists in this field would also help with. I found this presentation for this type of service to be enormously compelling, and, and I can see why it's being asked for. Um, is there, it also seems to be core. I mean, it seems to be that so common sense, so essential 
that that it's a shame that, that an application is having to be made to the CPA in order to fund it as a as a as an add-on. Is there is there some way that this, that this kind of counseling uh, or assistance that would be, is would not be made more permanent as perhaps a, a, a part of the cost of doing business if you if you operate um, uh, low-income housing here in the city uh, because uh, of course the individual being served in, in, in this in this housing need the kind of exactly the kind of counseling that we're talking about and and it's uh, uh, it's a shame that you're even having to be here <laughs> it is a shame and just uh, really quickly on our end we work off everything about the grants and whatever we can get our hands on and that's just been really tough um, so but, but for the long term i mean is there some um, some some uh, systematic way to address them. It's I think Wanda sort of nailed it. I know we talked about this last week, but it's um, it's really what the HCD says you can spend money on is what you can spend money on. So it's not an allowable item in your annual operating budget, and so you can cover the cost of a property manager, but property management sort of all day, every day, you don't know what's coming up. So the idea that you could set aside some headspace and some use some planning and intensive work is just, it's another body. So it's not, I agree with you that it would be nice that that would be allowable, but things have really been cut and cut and cut and cut. And we're just at the place where actually my agency can't afford a property manager. We have one person doing two jobs. So um, it's, it, you're, you're pointing out a, a clear problem that is in the system. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, in that case, we'll move on to the playground for two school. Good job. <laughs> activity needs with their mental activity needs. Um, and to have 
a really functional and what looks to me to be a great playground, something that will be uh, use, usable more of the year, um, even when it's raining, even when it's snowing. Uh, it looks like a great project, um, and it's got a lot of creative aspects to uh, things. For, so there are different things for kids to do. Um, of course, one of the, the things Murray particularly would have uh, enjoyed is the climbing uh, structure here. I mean, he was an avid rock climber, and this is sort of very uh, relevant for her in that. The other thing, as a 35-year resident of uh, Ward 3, I wanted to say that we think of the Bridge Street School as a community resource as well as just a school. We're, all, we're proud of it. We're glad there's a school there. Uh, and my children, my friends' children, have all played in the playground over the years. And to have, again, to have something that's more functional, that's got more uh, positive aspects to it, would be a wonderful addition to Board 3, as well as this week. Um, I encourage you to approve this project. Thank you, and uh, we're very excited about uh, the all the kids that have showed up here, and again, I wanted to thank uh, Mandy and uh, Beth and everybody else that has done so much work on this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Melvin Hershey. My daughter Marie taught at the Bridge Street School for 12 years before her untimely death last November. She would often tell me how pleased she was to see the spontaneous friendships which developed among the children in the playground as they enhanced their physical skills their self-confidence grew, their friendships became strengthened, and that was reflected back in the classroom, where she was also an expert in remedial teaching for children with problems in reading and mathematics. This is a wonderful project, and I urge the community committee to give serious consideration <coughs> to funding it. As far as the $35,000 is concerned, I have spoken with friends and other family members who have assured me they would come forth with whatever additional support is needed to reach that sum if it is a prerequisite for granting the application. Thank you. and Ward 6, and my kids went to Bridge Street School about 20 years ago, and at least a generation ago, I have three daughters, Marina, Carolyn, and Sophia Torog, and some of their teachers are here, which is wonderful, mm -hmm. and principal. Um, and I'm here because um, 22, 20 years ago, so the PTO and myself involved, we tried to rehab the playground, and it's astounding to think that a generation has gone by and that we they're talking about the same problems that we saw. Um, you know, a, tr a giant tree fell, a dead tree fell in the middle of the playground. Thank God no one was killed. Anybody remember that? Um, and uh, it was a, it, it, Mr. Zimmer, the Zimmerman who works for the city, when his wife passed away, she was very active in the building of the playground. Um, we planted a tree, but we had to go through this enormous process to plant the tree outside of the edge of the playground because we, and we didn't really yet have a space where we could put the tree when we did that in her honor. And that was about 15, 16 years ago, I don't even remember. But I wanted to mention that kids um, and families who use that space are from three wards. And, you know, Ward 6 is across town, and we all have used that space and will continue to do that. And the space, I'm here to talk about more about the community use of the playground. And uh, parents, um, not only parents of Bridge Street School kids, but parents can meet and talk and have a space where they can ha have meeting time and talking time. Grandparents were often there with their children. Oh, that's a space for um, seniors, families, community people. It's a place where Ward 6 and Ward 3 families can meet and um, you know, share the, the um, kind of outdoor pleasures that a lot of other um, places don't offer for those two wards. Um, you know, I think that um, an open space 
that we can preserve and build is something that many wards can use. Just like years ago when, um, um, the one with the big, big playground. Yeah. Yeah. Jackson, <laughs> Jackson Street built their playground. You saw people from all over the city who were there, and you could meet people <coughs> and talk to people, and you know, it's a real good coming together of space. And um, as someone who's watched this for years and years, I'm very impressed with the work that's gone into it. Um, I just think it's a benefit for the community. It's, a, it's an enormous benefit for several wards and for kids who come from an, uh, more of an urban space and kids who come from big middle class neighborhoods with big yards to meet together and like share the benefits of living in North Hampton. I think this does a wonderful job of doing that. Thanks. After me, my name is Karen Nelson. I live at Mountain Fort Street in Leeds, and I'm here to support the proposed improvements to the Bridge Street Playground. My family has been part of the Bridge Street community for five years. I have two children in fourth grade and a child in first grade. Research shows undeniably that children need opportunities to play in order to advance their social, emotional, and cognitive development. Play is where they learn self-control, how to cope with stress, and develop problem solving skills. With it essentially reduced or eliminated in our elementary school curriculum, play has been relegated to once a day recess. So if recess is the only time for children to play in a six hour school day, then they need an outdoor space that is engaging and stimulating and promotes imaginative play. Um, my children are a little shy to come up here and talk, so I asked them each to give me a quick little sentence that paraphrases their current playground. My son Aiden says, I am just tired of the dirt. <laughs> Dalton says that the playground is not safe. And, you know, shy, do you want to say it? <laughs> <laughs> so, I hope um, that with our support today, with the CPA not only sees our request for what it is, but a community project, community building project, but seriously considers the immediate and the long term impact that this project will have on our community. My name is Jared Bugger. I live at 127 Bridge Street which is right across from the school. I'm a neighbor, and I guess I'm afraid to have to say and miss it. Joquette may have to admit to it, but I'm a former student. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to second everything that's been said. I'm also former president of the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association until last October. This is a project that has been of great interest to the association. We followed it, and I believe there was an endorsement that came from it. Um, we are really proud of our part of the city. Ward 3 is, is undergoing enormous amount of renewal. A lot of young families, as you can see here, are moving in with their children, investing a lot of money into updating and modernizing their homes and their businesses. And the Bridge Street School playground is a block on what we hope to achieve in terms of renewing the, our ward. Um, I can look out my window on a windy day, it looks like the grapes of wrath are going out <laughs> I see kids coming covered in mud on wet days. It's really unsafe, it's really unpleasant to look at, and it really is something that needs to be taken care of. And I certainly hope that you folks will endorse this project, and you can be assured that I will be speaking to city councilors to approve the project, um, if you folks do. And it's long overdue, and I hope you'll give it your support.
since the beginning of thinking about this as um, people who were here 20 years ago can attest to that. And um, I just I think all the, all the teachers for coming tonight. I know you've been at school all day long already, and I really appreciate you being here. And the families for coming out with children tonight. Melvin and Steve, thank you so much for being here. Um, let's make this happen. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, excuse me. Thanks. 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 Hi, um, I'm Carol Bertrand. Um, I'm here in support of the playground uh, applications. Uh, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for Northampton to uh, benefit from the state grant that, uh, that came on and through the help of the Office of Planning and Development. It, it's just a wonderful opportunity and for both locations at Lantern Park, Park and as well as at um, the Florence Fields. Um, I'm a member of the Recreation Commission. I have been for 23 years. Um, I was also a, a teacher in Northampton for 33 years. So I'm in support of both of these projects uh, under the one application. Uh, I think it's a, a great opportunity to uh, enhance what we are already doing at the Florence Fields. Um, I've been here before. Um, as a member of the Bean Farm Task Force, and um, I'm uh, very appreciative of the money that the CPC has provided for um, not just the Northampton Recreation Department, but the, for the whole community to um, have these fields developed into two baseball fields and uh, five 
multi-purpose fields, and we're going to have generations of soccer players and baseball players and lacrosse players and other sports there for, for years to come, and, and their grandparents and their families and their siblings, and this one uh, recreation area, the little playground area, um, will be a great amenity for the overall project. And um, again, I'm grateful for the, the financial support we've had in the past. And we are actively um, fundraising to help with other amenities, but this will give, give us a huge boost, and we hope for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question? Question. Carol, question. Uh, and I apologize. I wasn't here the last meeting, so this was answered. The, the $200,000 state grant that you're going for, that, that, that requires a, uh, this 50,000 match. Is that, is that correct? Yes. That's yes. Yeah, that's that's that. Marie. Yes, that's true. And that, and, and, but that's, that has not come in yet, correct? The, the, the state has um, indicated that we will get the grant, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and we have to come up with a, with a the match, which is the 50,000. Okay, thank you. Yep. Can I ask a question? Yep. I'm sorry. Sure, I waited until you're almost. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are there are there follow-up or recurring costs that that are not included or covered by this grant that you'll have to cover in the future? And are you prepared to cover those? Um, this grant at both locations, Lantern Park, which will absolutely enhance what um, the, the um, project that was just presented to you um, will um, enhance that and then at Florence Fields it will start the um, part of the process for the large area that we want to do things for multiple ages so in the future there will be things that the fundraising group is going to be doing to add to it and then for taking care of the part the um, playgrounds and things all of them in the city well they're either taken care of by the DPW's uh, park and cemetery division or the school department's division so um, both of them will be in good hands for. And they've indicated that we're willing to. Oh to, yeah, absolutely. To do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Amber, is there a, do you have a status on the Vets Field project? I I know the recognition yes. has several open yes, projects, and all of them are moving going out to bid next week. Okay. Yes. It is uh, the the uh, contract was just signed with Berkshire Design for the um, bid process and getting that, and that's ready to go. We were intrigued by the material that was shown, the right. surface material, because right. it, it looks like it, it also conforms to ADA hand, uh, uh, wheelchair mm -hmm. uh, access as well. Is that yeah, right? it's really cool. They had a lot of different parks will put, put those in, in different areas for the reasons that they're talking about. And the durability yeah. is as good as they say? Yeah, from what I've seen, I haven't, we haven't put any in. This will be it, the first one, I think, in the same thing, so. But uh, across the state, people have them. So we just had a conference last week, and, and different um, parks have, have used them. So. It doesn't. It also doesn't seem to crater the way uh, loose material does. Right. Yeah. So is yeah. that usable around play structures directly, instead of the? Uh... Yep. There's all different. Yeah. They they place it around in different ways. I don't know if they actually put it the play structures right on top of it, or if they you know form a area that goes inside Presumably and it's around area. it. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. But there's they're talking about one that's just a, a you know solid. Without actual structures going on top of it, right now their structures are going to go around it. So. Are you at all concerned? We talked about this a little bit last yep. week in terms of Labyrinth Park. We're now potentially increasing the use by putting in some structures. So, mm -hmm. you know, driving by the last couple of days, that tends to get flooded out yep. in February, March, April. So, the potential of reducing grading and preventing. Yeah, we were actually just there. Um, we had a meeting and planning yesterday with the designers and went down there and looked at where it is right now because maybe it was you that I mentioned it, the, the spot, some of them. And we won't be able to do a ton in the whole area, but certainly we're, we're trying to you know, we'll work with the school and meet with them where potentially swings could go and um, the, what kind of fence and things like that, but like where the swings would go or any kind of other kind of structures or um, um, little climbing things would, would be somewhere that we'd definitely grade out and, and work with that. We found where there's some... Um, Areas that have drainage structures in them, so that they they've already kind of looked at that. So how can we can drain that way if you pitch it that way, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then the other part of that question would be in terms of inviting more use, or mm -hmm. going to see it replicated the same issues that they had at the school, where you start getting the dirt and the 
on sustainable grass. Right now it's kind of like a nice open space. People might play frisbee, but it's not an accurate. Yeah, it start. won't. It's not going to be the whole entire area. Uh, the, the money, I mean, that would take you know, tons and tons of. Um, what we're talking about is some smaller sections. So they would grade out and put down the, the material, which is usually some kind of um, wood wood carpet, sometimes it's called. Um, they would put that down underneath the structure or whatever goes up. Say, say a set of swings goes up. That would be there. So that wouldn't, and, and as long as you keep throwing more of that material in there each year, usually maintenance usually does that at all of our playgrounds um, each year. So that, or when someone calls and says, it's gotten down too low, and they go and they'll fill it in at the schools and different play structures around town. So. One more person. Don't one more. <laughs> well, good evening. Uh, my name is Jay Callum. I'm a resident of uh, Pine Street, Florence. And I just wanted to sort of veer off topic and talk about playgrounds for a little bit. Uh, my support. Um, father of two daughters and um, very excited about this, this project uh, in Florence and Florence Fields. And, and when I kind of looked at it, um, I really think that the, the finishing touch that it needs is that playground. And I think I'm definitely speaking on behalf of my six-year-old who uh, is often brought along to her older sister's sporting events. So I know the, the, uh, the importance and magic that a playground can, can bring in these type of events. So just want to know I'm a, I'm a resident there, uh, very excited about the project, and I, and I really thank you for your, your time and, and your consideration. Thank you. So this entire year, or is that no? Different? So this no. is the leftover from this fiscal year. Okay. So we, the uh, the first of uh, July, is that yes. correct? So we um, we get money from a per month basis for right. taxes for them. So we we may not actually have this all available right now. So if we spent everything in the negative spending, mm -hmm. but we have about the same available as there is requested this year. And what would we anticipate through the next state match? Carries through the, the next I have no idea. So the Community Preservation Coalition is working to do the same sort of thing that they did last time right. and increase the match, but they may not be successful. So it could be as low as 20%. Um, so I want I understood from the meeting I missed, which I apologize about, that there's a possibility that the uh, open space acquisition uh, is going to be withdrawn because uh, so I spoke to Wayne today, and although he hasn't progressed as far along with his acquisition as he has with others that he's brought forward, he's still pretty confident that he can work out a deal and he want, still wants it to move forward. But if it falls through, then you know, it's the chairman that would happen. Uh, uh, working out a deal at the same amount of money? Yes. So we're going to deal at the appraised value. At the appraised, at the appraised value. value. The original. Right. I mean, it's not. It's not. He can't go over the appraised value. So, so, but they didn't walk away right away. No. Okay. All right. So then, our typical. So, can I just ask a question about the funding? So, I think sure. one would be. It would be really helpful at some point to either have 
spend a dedicated portion of our meeting with either Sarah or John walking us through that chart. And part of us, when we're responsible for the multi-million dollar budget, it would be really good to fully understand how things go in, how things come out, and when we get these reports and someone says, you got this much money to spend, what that truly means. I'm still confused. Is the 851 the split from what we had last time? It is. Yes, yeah, so that's, what, is, that's what's remaining. Okay. From so if we take a two-cycle round, this is the remainder, as opposed to we have 851 per year and we split it in half. Yes. Okay. So this right. is the end of it. So we that's the, that's, that's the disjoint do. between the fiscal year ending yeah. and the yeah. And as far as the overview, <coughs> we could do that in time. We could do it before we complete this funding round, or we could wait. I'd be happy to do that anytime. Well, I mean, I guess it's helpful to do it before we make an award. It might be helpful just because that this large amount that we seem to have is, I think, in large part due to the match going from in the 20s up to above 60 percent. And so if, in fact, I, I guess I would like to see two projections, one assuming for the next match period that we receive back down into the 20s, because mm -hmm. that might affect our behavior now, and then the other would be making an optimistic projection. Certainly, to expend all this and then have the match drop, you know, and say, "Oh, we have more than, you know, more than enough." It's pretty Fine. easy. You just subtract four hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> well, I, I guess it's um, yes. Uh, but the piece I thought that I had not quite understood because it was just, I, I never liked the sort of vagary of we don't exactly know, and I didn't realize you were taking in your tax monies monthly. That uncertainty on the income from that is part of the I don't know. So even that little bit of news just now was good for me. Sure. Yeah. I, anytime you want to, I mean, I can do a PowerPoint. I would put that on first. Okay. For next time. Right. Okay. Sure. Uh, um, Sarah, could you also? Um, we had last year a summary of how much we've spent in each category. I was wondering whether we could just get that updated, you know, how much we spent in housing, how much we spent in the store, how much we spent. Well, we're with the spreadsheet that John sent around has that. Uh, yeah. Oh, it was in, in, in the last one? Of the amount and also is the leverage that that's been updated. If you go into the spreadsheet, it has different sheets. Uh, oh, 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 okay. Sheet. Uh, and so it would have over a cumulative number for everything we spend for housing. Okay. Oh, okay. Over what time frame? <clears throat> so this is cumulative through the last funding round. Cumulative since CPA money started? Yeah. Yeah. cycle in terms of debt. <coughs> anything that you what does that cycle mean? That kind of a payment cycle. Is anything that we paid off that will you mean that we are requiring? Yeah. Uh four is But what Florence Fields is just going up the that that has been anticipated right now. Florence Fields are just going out now? Yes. I mean, to a long-term bond, they had been in anticipatory notice until until they could roll it up with a bunch of other projects. And how much was Forbes? For? Forbes was. And retiring soon means when? just made the last Forbes
memory of a few meetings ago when we talked about doing the qualifications on the projects. The yes. And that we might talk about doing that differently than at the 10 o'clock hour. Yeah, I, 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 talked to, I talked to Sarah about this, um, and my thought was that when we have, um, just in my experience at the Conservation Commission, we do an order of conditions to the Conservation Commission. When you, when you make the motion to issue an order of conditions, we don't say, well, let's issue an order of conditions for this project, and everyone votes yes, and then later on we all come up with conditions for the developer. That doesn't work. So I would say that our procedure should be the same. If you have a condition that you that is necessary for you to vote for the project, then it needs to be part of the motion. And so the motion would include voting money and any conditions you feel necessary, minor or major. Um, and again, um, I don't think we have any need to streamline the language we pass on to the city council. In fact, city council has expressed more information, not less. So if our motion needs to be long and it needs to have extensive, be translated into excessive whereas clauses, then why not? I think that's a better way of doing it. I think it's also come up in the past that people have voted for projects with some conditions attached. And then later, when we've gone back to drafting contracts, people have actually voted against the motion to approve the contract because the contract had a condition attached. So there, you know, so then you wonder how would their vote have been changed on the initial recommendation if that condition had been brought up. So um, I guess our, if we're done with the budget update, what we usually do now is just quickly go through, um, give our 30 second um, thoughts so that we can have something to take into account as we go and complete our ranking sheets. But I would also say, come, you know, when you come back with your ranking sheets, come back ready, come back with a motion ready, um, both a funding amount and specific conditions that you would attach. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. In terms of the ranking sheet, maybe it would be helpful if, in addition to ranking it and giving them comments, that if people are aware of any conditions they would like to, that way, if we get involved right. in the discussion, at least Sarah can say, someone raised this, someone raised that, or if one of us is absent for some reason for voting, at least their condition can be considered. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm always one for actually forcing people to write the actual language that they wish to have on the recommendation, rather than just say, I want a condition about monitoring, okay, because that then forces us all to respond to something that's not very definite. So yeah, I would, I would you know, in that notes section that we usually have, Sarah, if you want to, you know, expand that, so your notes would include this, and as, be as specific as you can. Maybe modify it when we get here, but again, as, as Dave said, it gives us something to go from if you're not here, and also gives um, people ability to think about it um, more specifically and craft their response to the court. So. And you want that when, Sarah? Uh, mm -hmm. For the next meeting. I'll send them out and I'll copies. Okay. And the day of the next meeting is what can you give me? Yeah. April 2nd. Thank you. When? April 2nd. April 2nd. April 2nd. All right, so without further ado, if we're ready, we can proceed to um, just our quick evaluations. Housing supporting services. Devin, I'll start with you. Um. <clears throat> the whole set in 30 seconds. I, I like all the projects. The only one I have a question about is the grandstand preservation. I like it a lot. I uh, don't, I, I want to make sure that we are dealing with the historic preservation project, not a, not something different. And so that's the only one that I've even had any thoughts about. But I like, uh, uh, I, I know it feels a little awkward to have Chris Wright coming back to us again, but my reaction is I liked it last time. I understand why they're coming back and, and I'll like it again. I certainly like the housing counselor. Um, I was I was cool on that one until I really understood that it mm -hmm. seems to make a difference. I mean, I, I was more like I was just staffing a person, what can they do? But I think we've heard from uh, people who really know their business in that area. Um, 
obviously, the playgrounds. Um, I, I think the parks department has you know, grant money that we need to leverage. You know, so that's, that's my take on the whole set, actually. My comments echo Deborah um, on the issue of the historic uh, the preservation of the grandstands. Um, the phrase I use is, is we're not here to support um, seeding renewal, uh, but we are, which is what they're after and we can understand and might well be a, a, a very reasonable exercise uh, for them. But our, our primary effort is toward the, 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 the preservation of the overall envelope of the building and its uh, you know, exterior and, support and structural uh, integrity. Uh, and that we welcome, I would welcome a uh, more detailed uh, application describing that. Um, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm in favor, obviously, of the, uh, the, the playground uh, that was uh, discussed tonight, and as well as the one on uh, Lawrence Fields. Um, I'm clearly, um, I think the uh, housing uh, counselor is a, is a great idea. Um, and uh, and the open area, open space area too. So I'm, I'm in favor of all all that. Okay. Um, so I know that in particular, I just want to make sure that when we do this, so the survey in Rocky Hill. Comfortable. My reaction is we need to do it at some point, and we can now. Okay. So. Yeah. And David, that would be you as well. Yeah. Um, a voting block here. Brian. So we want us to do what they're doing. Well, you don't, you don't, don't feel that has blown my attempt to allow us yeah. to all hear our considered, you know, input. We wish to retain <coughs> the usual method. So what do you guys think? <laughs> I think? I think if you're given an opportunity to voice, you know, just go to the now. Okay. So let them, well, let well, them flow. Well, I think the biggest problem facing the world is overpopulation. <laughs> Having playgrounds encourages people to have children. You know it's a good I'm opposed to anything that brings kids out on school nights. Um, I'm kidding, kidding. <laughs> the, the only things that I, um, I sort of, and again, forgive me for not being here, so I shouldn't even ask questions, but the community housing thing, I, I don't get how we fund someone where there's no organization in place to do it. I don't, that seems like we're putting the cart before the horse. Shouldn't there be someone who's willing to take this person in and supervise them? I think you're asking me for $5,000 a year for that, that uh, goes for the administration, which seems really low to me. I mean, I understand how we just fund sort of this idea of someone somewhere and um, as much as important as it seems and the, and the folks were really compelling but again I, I guess I would need more uh, input on that um, I've never understood Christopher Heights I, I never will and I, I just can't grasp how we're now giving more money to it because I because I never understood it to begin with and now they've pulled out this whole thing that I was trying to grasp my brain around, I'm still um, unclear as to what the money actually does. But again, my fault, I missed the movie. Uh, the grandstand also, I'm less enthusiastic about. Uh, but you know, both of the playground ones, the open space acquisition, um, the, the uh, are, I'm very excited about. In the survey, the survey. So yeah, I would, I would not prioritize that. If we had the money, I think it's great. Otherwise, it, it could be put, it could be put on. I think it, it would be last on my list. Okay. I missed the meeting also, Brian. So I'm there with you in regard to the social uh, support services project. I'm sure they did a really good job last meeting as well. I just have a hard time getting my head around funding a position. I mean, I think if you go to any social service agency and say, you know, what, what position would you like, you know, what, what, what are your needs? 
they can come up with 10 different positions, if we could fund them, that would better serve the community, better you know, do their job, help them do their jobs. Just don't, I don't see where it's really CPA money that should be lined up to do that. You know, that's part of it. The second part is, is it a short-term fix? You know, if we, if we fund it for three years, can they tell us exactly how that is going to be funded following that? I understand if you give it a one year, who are you going to get to do that job and how qualified are they going to be? And obviously, they're going to do a better job the second year that they've had that job and the third year even still. But still, that's a lot of money to fill a position that in three years, then it goes away, then we're back to where we started, where we are now, basically. So if there were an opportunity for them to give us a, some ideas on how they're going to keep that position going, that would be more important. It's a great position. I can see where there's a need for it. Um, but I do have some problems with it, obviously. And the other one is the three kind of fear now. It just sounds to me as though they're, they're, they're walking a fine line between historic preservation and um, making it a functional structure. And I would have to defer to people that know more about historical preservation um, in that regard. There's a lot of money being spent down there, and there's going to be a lot of money being spent down there. Does it necessarily, I would try to put a, a square peg into a round hole when it comes to it falls into the historical um, Sawmill Hills, if there, it's there, it's definitely it's the same way, kind of low on the totem pole. Um, playground with a, and that? Uh, it's open space acquisition. And Christopher mm. Heights. Christopher Heights is confusing, but uh, the numbers that they put out make a lot of sense in regard to cost per unit. Mm -hmm. That's, That's for sure. It's short money, so to speak, with what the projections are. So I'm going to go that. And the open space acquisition. Um, so rec uh, fuels, uh, as for I am concerned that the Bankman Park is a little bit of an add-on and not particularly coordinated with the school. It's not clear what the vision is other than putting lines underground and putting up a fence for what that park will look like. So it's kind of going blind a little bit like Classic Park with that planning concept. But I also feel like they secured heck of a lot of money from the state, and it's, I mean, it's not a, not a sizable amount, but it's a reasonable amount for us to be spending where we know there'll be a dividend, and the community cares about that area, so if it is complimentary, <coughs> maybe that's okay. Um, Bridge Street School, I am in favor of, but I would like to see someone work out to issue with the city mm -hmm. leaving the snow on yeah. something we're going to be spending. $200,000 on. Yeah. seems like there should be a fix to that. Yeah, is there a condition there that can we, is that appropriate or is that overstepping our authority to add the snow removal? Mm. Yeah. Certainly, if, certainly we can ask for it. And again, the city clears snow from many, many places. They clear snow from parking lots for revenue. They clear snow from streets to make them passable why they wouldn't think that this is a priority, I'm not sure. Just changing the directives. Right. I mean, they clear the parking lots of Northampton High. They could tell the kids, high school kids, just to walk from far away, but they don't do that. So I'm not sure why this is a different situation and why it couldn't be negotiated. Did plowing in there, or are they, are they uh, using a loader? They use a loader. Well, they, yeah, I mean, they, they must use a loader. They use a plow. Yeah, they push the snow. Right, that was the snow and fire. They but take but it away at their leisure. The design had this, this wonderful, uh, innocent looking set of barrier tables and benches between the playground and the and the driveway parking lot, uh, the, the, thereby preventing the plows from pushing the snow up onto, the, onto this new playground. So I thought that was pretty clever. Uh, <laughs> and I don't know if the DPW had seen that again or not, but if they, they'd have to use a loader to get it over the over these. That's tires. not where they're putting the snow. They're putting the snow on basketball court. Which is oh, oh, oh okay, all right. So I mean, it's a hazard for kids. To be so this would still be open even. It melts, it freezes, it melts, it freezes, which is bad for the asphalt. Right. The same issue with the 
river in the Rio Park that they wanted to go in after the fact on the newly constructed paths, asphalt paths, but heavy machinery just doesn't make any sense. So that would be my condition there. And I'll think about that a little more. Sawmill Hills, not a priority for me, not clear what acquisitions we'll have in and around that area, and it's a matter of doing business for all of our properties anyways, and so that's the lowest of priorities, and that was the lowest of planning department's priorities. Open space, I'm going to reserve judgment until I go out and we plan a site visit. I think everyone wanted to do. She doesn't agree that she wants to sell it to the city, so that may be good. Uh, fairgrounds, I share everyone's concern. I feel like the compromise there is, you know, it feels like it's a very expensive feasibility study for something that doesn't fit within historic, except the only addition they made to their application was to actually add in historic value. So if they want to spend $50,000 to do a seating upgrade, my compromise might be, you know, we'll give you the 4400 bucks for the historic person and report back what the historic nature of this facility is. There's no guarantee that they're going to keep it either. They might knock it down and we would have spent 50 grand to find out that we're knocking down something that's actually really valuable. Uh, Christopher Heights uh, is a good project. I like the project. I feel like they've gone before the state twice and haven't been successful. I think we ponied up what we were asked to pony up and you know, haven't been provided anything convincing to show that the costs have escalated to the extent that we should more than uh, double our commitment. And that, I'm somewhat bothered that the city pulled its tip, regardless of whether it was favorably viewed by the state. If this is a worthwhile endeavor and it's something that the city wants to retain, that 5% or something more seems appropriate when we're giving 13 or 20% to Cole Morgan and the Coca Cola to keep them. Um, I don't know what I'm doing with that. I don't want to lose the project, but I also know that we have other similar projects that were proposed for this round for thrown on and we have other affordable housing things to be done. And I feel like our commitment is there. So uh, what's next? Uh, supportive service project. I like the project I see the need. I think it's really important. I'm more concerned about the structure and ensuring that the services will be delivered and the <coughs> concerns that have been raised already in that one, we have a definition for support services that needs to go to an entity that actually owns or manages housing. And so that was an issue that we tabled so we could see the proposal. I think we need to talk about that. And it, I would be I would have much more comfort if one of the organizations that spoke in favor of this came forward as a co-sponsor saying, we want to take it on, we have the people who supervise whoever this person is who's coming in, we want to contribute overhead, we're going to make this successful as opposed to going out to bid without knowing what the parameters for the bid package are, is this the lowest price, is there qualifications, what are the qualifications, it seems like it's the actual people doing their work or three steps removed from the CPM, which is uncomfortable. And it's a large amount of money. And, and the way they broke it down, it came out to, they thought they might be able to help 20 to 24 families each year, which is a lot if you're one of those families. And, you know, I think the services are essential, but it comes out to about $2,000 a family in terms of services. We're, it's more like 40 families or 50 or 60, and I feel like it's a bang for the buck. But for something that's experimental, where we don't know who's doing it, that, I have attention. Uh, unresolved at this point. Where did you get the 24 a year? That was during their presentation. Yeah, it was. Oh, I'm sorry. So, right, that was the current. Nope. No, that's it. Um, I just want to get the lawyers uh, input. So we've been reading the support of community housing to require that the money be given to an organization uh, that operates or manages such housing. But looking at this, support of community housing shall include, but not be limited to, programs that provide grants, loans, rental assistance, security deposits, interest rate write downs, or other forms of assistance directly to individuals and families who are eligible for community housing or to an entity that owns, operates, or manages such housing for the purpose of making housing affordable. So when I read that, the programs that provide grants that that's, right, modifying the programs that provide grants, but 
it begins with shall include but not be limited to. So it seems to me that that definition is wide open. Like the, the, the first shall include but not be limited to, if that's not modified by organizations that provide or manage housing. So in which case, I think that the legislation gives us, at least the text of the legislation wouldn't restrict us, regardless of who the money was given to. I was just, I just after rereading and rereading, I wasn't sure. But again, um, that's up to us as a committee really to decide whether it falls into. So. Joe? I actually wonder if I start there, because yeah. I read that and reread that. Yeah. Trying to really understand what it says, right. because this is a social work project. Right. I understand that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very difficult to really understand how successful it's going to be. It's going to depend on the individual. Mm -hmm. It's a social work project. Go out and assist. And, you know, there are parameters. And so, you know, and, I mean, it's a couple hundred grand. It's been already said before, you know, you, you give the money six months later, you may have the person. Six months later, that person may finally understand the system, unless, you know, they already work in the system. And it could be a year before direct services are actually provided. There's 70,000, whatever. I mean, I, you know, and, and on the fiscal side of it, it's kind of a tough one. However, <clears throat> On the reality side of it, it's really as in order to keep a roof over some people, think, whether it's 20 families a year or whether it's 15 families a year, multiply that 45 families. It's like one of the most essential things that anybody can need to have. And so, and what kind of value does one have on that? I mean, I know that everybody's sort of trying to balance these kinds of things out. I would prefer, if appropriate, if an organization came in and said, this is who I am, this is what we're doing, we're going to provide overhead, 10%, 17%, just give us the money to cover the cost, and within 45 days, we'll have this program up and running, and we're going to have supervisors, and we're going to be in the court system, and we're going to be working with the housing, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> That's not the case. This is a housing partnership. And if they haven't identified somebody yet, an agency, to come in and say, I mean, like, what have they been doing, is, is my question. I don't know. I mean, and, and, and so that's sort of on that part of this. I like the project. It makes sense because it's an essential piece of the puzzle for maybe 100 families <coughs> over the next two years. And what kind of price would you put on Well, on the other side, what you can do is, you can set aside money to cover rent for X <laughs> you know, I mean, and so anyway. Um, that's, those are the issues that I have on that. Christopher Heights, I like the project, I like the concept of the project, which is providing, um, you know, affordable housing to seniors. I mean, give me a break. That's going to be pretty significant. Sure. Um, open space is open space. I mean, if we got the money, let's buy it. If we're not going to buy it. Bridge Street Playground, it's sweet. I like that project. Very smart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, playground, floor and fields, play, yes, let's play. Sawmill so survey, you know, if they need it and we've got the money, I mean, you know, they want 40000 I'll put that at the bottom. Um, grandstand is quite, I, everybody raised the same issues. I mean, if, if it is historic, you know, will help. But, you know, I've read it. I don't need to hear what they have to say. I'm not convinced, but I can be convinced if people here say it really is an historic preservation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess that's it. Okay? Isn't that all of them? Right. Can I make a yes. final comment? Um, I just wanted to flesh out my, my comments on Christopher Heights earlier. I, I do support it, and we'll, we'll vote for it. Um, because I think it's a, it's a great project, and it will be good for its location. I think it will be good for jobs for the city. Um, 
I think it'll be good because it will help the city address its required uh, percentages of uh, housing uh, for, for a lower income. Um, but I, 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 as I support it, um, I also want to say that it's, a, it's an unusual way to address I, I, this. I'm addressing it from an ethical issue now. An unusual way to address the low and moderate income housing issues of the city because you can take somebody who was earning quite a bit of money and very comfortable and with significant assets, real and otherwise, um, and with, with a good tax attorney, uh, have that person five years later looking uh, uh, virtually penniless. And that's not much of a secret. Um, and anybody with parents in nursing homes knows that. Um, and it, the result is that, that identifying who is, in fact, low and moderate income and who is low and moderate income by dint of tax accounting um, is, is very difficult. Uh, so we, we, I support this project wholeheartedly, but with the knowledge that, that and I hope we all do this, that we may not, in fact, be really tackling, we should not pat ourselves on the head necessarily that much, because I don't, I don't know how to the extent we're tackling the, the, the problem, the very real problem of housing for low and moderate income people in Northampton. Um, we're doing a nice thing. Uh, some of the people there will be low and moderate income, but we'll be definitely helping them. And there'll be some people who take advantage of this and conform to the standards of, of, of the, this project um, who uh, otherwise probably could be able to afford uh, this from, uh, from, their, from their trust. So it's just a, it's an editorial on my part, um, mostly to say to ourselves, you know, CPC, work harder uh, to uh, continue to support other kinds of low and moderate income because uh, this, is, this is nice, but it's probably not, it doesn't address the broader issue of, you know, fam single parent families with, uh, you know, kids and, and, and uh, uh, who are really struggling against uh, the current and, uh, you know, living on the edge at all times. have a lot to add. The Housing Supportive Services, um, obviously, you know it's an important project, but the lack of follow-on funding is to, st to start up the project and have it run for three years. And what we heard tonight was the admission that there's, there's no funding. So, you know, my thought was usually when we have a project like this, we're the seed money, it's a great idea, but everyone knows it's a great idea, and yet it's been cut. So it's hard to see where between now and years from now where somebody decides it's, wow, this essential thing that we're not doing, let's let's start actually doing it. Um, Christopher Heights, to me, comes down to the unit cost um, of creating the housing. Um, I, I hear what Dave says about projects being in the pipeline that may be important, but, um, but this one is here and uh, and again, I'm not, I'm not sure whether they'll be any more successful in this round for low-income housing tax credits, but if they are, it will be a very low unit cost for creating those units. Um, the playground creation uh, at Lampton Park and Florence Fields with the substantial state funding seems like a good way to leverage our money. Uh, you know, I, I do note that, again, it was one of these things where the grant application said fundraising and or CPA. And so again, it's, um, you know, I, I, I think that there will be a lot of people going to Florence Fields who will, you know, myself included, will benefit from the playground being there. So, again, it's, we don't necessarily have to force them to come up with a certain amount of money, but to have applicants actually send a letter. I mean, obviously, Bridge Street has aroused enough excitement in the community. They've gotten $12,000 without even sending out the letter. So um, $12,000 is a pretty big piece of 50. Um, so, um, you know, I'm not sure that affects the amount of, of, of what I would vote to award, but um, you know, cer certainly conditioning it, conditioning it on making a fundraising attempt because there may be maintenance costs, there may be a, you know, additional costs that they don't anticipate would be nice to have reserved. Um, the survey, if we can afford it, I think it makes sense in terms of doing something now to avoid costs later. 
I, I support the, the Rocky Hill acquisition largely because I never understood the business park zone. Um, when, our, when our wetlands ordinance was amended, we pushed back development 200 feet from vernal pools. Um, we, you know, we set these, in undeveloped areas, we set these 50-foot no-disturb um, protected zones. But the business park, which is largely just undeveloped woods, was left off the table. And of course the idea was this is close to the Route 10 infrastructure, but when you begin to look at the property, the property has a lot of wetlands complexes, the property has vernal pools. Um, so it's not brown fields, I mean it's really green fields that we would be developing, and it's right across the street from already protected lands. So to, um, to protect this uh, piece seems important to me. I'm also, again, just a little bit, um, our wetlands ordinance is also now, it's based on zoning. Whatever your zoning is on the map determines your level of protection. And the fact that the part of the business park was being moved into industrial, which has the lowest level of protection, um, you know, makes me think that we should, we should protect things you know, now because um, zoning seems to be pretty malleable. Um, so I would, I would support that. And again, it will depend on whether the property owner wants to go forward with that sale. Um, again, I would note that um, in terms of Wayne Fiden's judgment about property purchases, that he, he was spot on with that one um, and got the second appraisal that brought the price down by a couple hundred thousand dollars. So um, I, tr I, trust, I trust his judgment in terms of assembling pieces of land at lowest cost. Um, the grandstand. Again, I keep comparing it to the Northampton Community Music Center. Um, the music center is a nonprofit, and it but it you know charges people for lessons, um, and you know but it provides a lot of scholarship aid. And when we had the project to to basically save their foundation and waterproof their basement, it was very clear that we we delineated those parts where that were going to prevent the building from falling into disuse or become unusable because of water intrusion and mold issues and all the stuff that they built out as part of their ongoing business of providing music education. What's never, what I don't see here is um, that absolute division between the ongoing business of the fairgrounds, which I you know, recognize the economic impact to the city, and just like people have said, the very narrow mission of historic preservation of the structure. Right? Evaluation of the structure from a historic perspective um, and what we do to you know, not change the grandstand seating because that has nothing to do with, with historic preservation. That's for a function um, for, for the fairgrounds going forward. But, um, and I just note that the price tag is fairly high for a study that is not Right. We're not going to get toward, if they, if they tell us how to preserve the roof and the judge's um, boxes, I can only imagine that they'll come back to CBC for a recommendation for funding for a significant portion, if not all, of that rehabilitation. So, um, so you know, again, comparing it maybe to the Academy of Music where they were asking for $110,000 for a roof. For $110,000, you know, $110, you've got a new roof. Um, this is almost half that amount, and it's just to decide what to do. So, um, so that's a that's a difficult one for me. I want, to, I, I want that historic structure preserved, but I want to make sure that um, we are investing in it wisely. And finally, um, Bridge Street School is a great project. The community is um, fully engaged. Again, I I just lament um, I lament that that. I'm a school committee member for a school department that can't build playgrounds for its kids. Um, and that's not a comment on, you know, I, I take them at their word that we're not supplanting funding, that, you know, this, this recommendation and this award would be money that they would somehow find somewhere else. Um, but again, like the, you know, going back to the first, like the supportive services project, there are some things that I think used to be considered essential and natural parts of spending in a city that um, now are considered extraordinary expenditures uh, that, that have to come from somewhere else. So that's my thoughts.
We'll have an opportunity to discuss the project one more time, right? Yes, yes. So we will now, um, you'll get your ranking sheets. Can I ask um, one, yeah. one thing again? Forgive me for my ignorance about the um, Christopher Heights thing, but can someone just in a few sentences, so, so what does this money do? We've already given them 120. <coughs> it was for the TIF, we amended it, so they don't have the TIF. Now they want another 130. So what more, What does our 250 do? The construction costs have risen slightly since the project was first proposed because they, they weren't able to get started because they didn't get their low income housing tax credit. Um, so there's been a small jump there. And also because there's no TIF, they're hoping that this additional commitment will show how interested they have in this project and make that, those low income housing tax credit applications successful. It's, it's, there's not a consistent percentage. I mean, the, the rise in, the increase in costs was $500,000. Mm -hmm. So, so percentage-wise, you know, asking for 120 of a $14 million budget or $13 million and not asking for you know, another 130 out of 500 is a much greater percentage. It seemed, the presentation, what I took from the presentation, other committee members can weigh in, was just they decided the city and the Grantham group that that was the amount they felt would win them the low income housing tax credits. And those those are the prize. If they don't get those, the project doesn't go anywhere. If they get those, they go forward. So if they don't get the low income uh, tax credits, we get two fifty back. Yes. I can't I can't imagine the project goes forward any other way. Thank you. Well, I think what we don't understand is, and we ask them, what was it when they went back to the state that made them less competitive than other applicants? Because the applicants are all across the board, low-income housing for elderly. There's lots of different projects, and the state has different priorities. So it may not matter how much we give, because they're always going to be out-competed by whatever the majority of the state. It may be that there's some other aspect of the project that the state doesn't like, irrespective of how much we do. And this seems to be kind of like a bringing another rock exercise. Well, they didn't like TIF, and they get something else. They don't like 120, bring us 300. The next time they'll come in, and they'll say it's 500. Now, I don't know if there's no way to really know that. Really, it's just another way of trying to control the money out of the state. Seems I did look at the list of projects that were approved in the last round, and there were quite a few that were by, you know, things that had senior in the title. I uh, don't know whether those are assisted living, but um, I think this is an area of need. And again, I guess it's up to them to decide. However, they've not done it successfully twice, so in terms of the application has been turned out. I have one other comment about the community uh, council. Um, I, I had not been bothered by the fact that one group had not brought this forward because as Glenn said, any, any group would accept a staff person. You know, they would, they would, that's not the problem. So I viewed the way they were pro proposing to do this as sending out RFPs and having the players that know their business propose how to do it once they knew they had a budget to do it with as a pretty viable way to go about doing that. Or whatever yeah. that's worth. So I wasn't bothered by the we don't know who it is yet because I think any of the it's would take it if we let them kind of thing. So that's well, just my um, top topic. Yeah, it just seems that let's just like pick a service net. Yeah. The service net and the housing formation are really interested in this project. They could make this project look a lot better. But service that would be interested in, in Hampshire, you know, all, I think yeah, the no, list of put would be long. And and it would be interesting if they actually came up with an idea that leveraged whatever it is that we were going to be doing. I mean, this and picked up, you know, what's going to happen at the end of <coughs> yeah. this funding period. So well, my that's worry, all. My it worry just seems was to that be, there was a metric that you could, because other than coming back three years later, if the three years gives them history that they can show without a doubt effectiveness, mm -hmm. then I think they are in a position to chase some other monies as well as ours. So they write grants all the time. So 
So I think that's the thing. Yeah. That's what I think. So are your points addressable through conditions that we might, you know, think? No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. You know, because it would, it would like recreate the whole thing. I mean, they have, you know, a project. And, a, and I think what the statute says, they got a project. And so, you know, I'm not going to no. play around with the project, you know, I think. <clears throat> and this is real, pure, and simple social work. I mean, this is going out into the fields, into the home, education, networking, Community support. This is in its purest sense social work, keeping people off the street by educating, training, as opposed to giving them money. Mm -hmm. Right. You know. I mean, this. And so, like, what's the limits of benevolence? You know, that's another. Different topic. I was going to bring this up later, but the, given the discussion about the fairground building, that is a large article in the Globe, in the Herald today about Suffolk Downs and there's this, this juggernaut of a rate of a casino that was going to be going into the Suffolk Downs uh, area of just north of Boston. And apparently it's been held up because the Mass Historical Commission has determined the horse stalls, which are look which which look in the photographs to be almost identical to the horse stalls that were likely torn down. Was that kind of disrepair too? that the horse stalls are of such historic significance wow. that the entire casino juggernaut should be caught, stopped dead in its track. Oops. Um, and I say that because, well, and regardless of heights, and this is not, this is not a, an issue about how one feels about gambling, but it's an issue of, of how statewide, a very responsible state agency, I mean, see, is a, is a very powerful and responsible agency, um, are looking at something as, as humble as the horse stalls that we're all familiar with from if you ever walk around fairgrounds in the old days, um, are alone of such value that they would stop a project of that magnitude. Uh, you can imagine the steam that's, a, that's rising out of some certain sectors in Boston and Las Vegas right now. But um, uh, it, it does speak to the fact that people really do consider fairground structures to have a certain vernacular and uh, a quality of appeal that is, is hard to replicate and certainly I know we've, for anybody who's lived here and driven down uh, uh, Bridge Street um, between the center of town and, and the river, we get used to seeing, you know, the, the, the fair structures and so forth. But in actual fact, it, you know, look at Courier and Ives Prints and, and, and look, you'll see buildings just like what we have and, and it's a, it's quite a, it's a unique um, style of architecture that existed for a little while. In American history, that would be certainly very different than what would be put up nowadays. And um, um, you know, in the eyes of the, of the Northampton Historical Commission, well worth preserving um, if, uh, if the opportunity arises. But I also take your point about the cost of advice, and, and I will I will be thinking about your, your comment. And, and the, the fairgrounds hasn't gone through the Northampton Historic. No, they Commission? did. They came. The, the Historical Commission basically invited the fairgrounds folks to work with us on the issue and um, they were open to that they've not done so yet but they indicated that they were open to do that but the historical commission has indicated that it feels that the preservation of, of the of the um, totality of, of the the um, grandstand structure is a valuable um, Goal and uh, uh, certainly would support any effort toward the uh, preservation of that structure. I think there's less, um, there's no specific effect here for for the, the seating arrangement. I don't think that was considered that, that salient, but the, the, the roof line, the, the, the general architecture of it, the structural support of it um, is, is, a, is a unique structure and unique to the city. and. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, almost unique to the valley. Um, it uh, uh, predates uh, um, anything, I think, at, at, at uh, uh, Big E, uh, and uh, there might be something in, in, in uh, Great Barrington that uh, uh, 
has some similar dates to it, but it's an unusual, unusual structure. I thought you were going to say that predates the French and Indian War. I try to rephrase there. I just need it to say. And, and you know, are we done with the? We are. That, could I have one? I have one important thing that actually uh, I do want to bring up that it concerns it quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure how many of us were here for the discussion about the uh, First Churches um, uh, project. Uh, to which we gave something like a quarter million dollars uh, for the uh, work for work on the roof and work on interior. Can I just, I just want to say, this, this is, since it's not on our agenda, can we can we put this on the agenda for next time? Because I think it would be. I mean, I I don't know whether we, we waited five minutes for you. I thought I was using up my allotted two more minutes. No, no, no. It's just that I mean, just because it's not on the agenda, and if people do want to weigh in on it. I would think it would be. I don't see. Even, even, even the community. No, I was not going to be proposing a motion. It's purely informational. But even informational, okay. it's. I mean, it's. If we don't have it, I mean, is this? If we're having a back and forth over it, and then we later take action, I just want to keep it clean. So, um, if you just want to tell people what they're proposing, and then we can. That'll be it. Read the newspaper tomorrow. <laughs> oh, it's already. It's already. It's already after. So. But, Sarah, if you want to put that down, um, I just think that it would be. The only agenda for you were already quoted, so. Sarah's always quoted. Uh, you were already quoted as being displeased. Ooh. Oh, oh, no, no. <laughs> so. so, before we adjourn, can I ask the status of the same visit? It may be difficult to arrange a site like that. I can check, but it may be tough. Okay. Yeah. It's a lot of money for a parcel that we're not allowed to access to view and make a determination on. So I don't know what our procedure would be, whether or not that's something. I mean, was, we can do it. I don't know what I would do in that circumstance, but it seems unfortunate. Does Wayne have some detailed topo maps or anything that would get, get a medium in between? I'll see if a site visit can be arranged, and if not, then I'll get as much information about it as possible. We can pose as wealthy <laughs> investors. I <laughs> know what that was like. But we couldn't <laughs> trespass. Maybe, maybe not post. Maybe I'm all for a bear suit. They're all out. Yeah, no, I mean, we should. I mean, we do have, the city does have total maps of it down to about five feet. So, you know, the, we have survey maps, we have GIS, but if you want to actually go lay eyes on it, we can see. But. She might charge you two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so that be said, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor.